Happy Wednesday, uh, because Wednesday is when I usually release these things, and welcome back to Cleric Swear Ringmail. Today, I've got an unboxing for you, one of my very atypical unboxings, or in this case, it's a PDF, so more of an unprinting, uh, well, printing and then reading. Huh, I'm going to have to come up with a new name for these things. Anyway, listen on for The Underground Architects Dungeon Ecology. Recording outside today. Uh, the This went over really well in the call-in section of last episode, so I figured I would just go ahead and do that again. I've got my... Well, I'm out here with my older son talking about lawnmowers and reading through the Underground Architects Dungeon Ecology. So, what is the Underground Architects Dungeon Ecology? It is a step-by-step -step guide to creating a believable dungeon ecology, if the title page is to be believed. Written by Stephen Smith. I found a deck and it broke it. Wait, no. uh, Y'all may remember Stephen had come on the podcast talking about World of Weirth a few episodes ago, and he was kind enough to send me a review copy of this uh, little zine. Uh, the pages are not numbered, uh, but it's... Uh, Ooh. I printed it out booklet style. It fits in my hand. I was able to parse through it in probably about 10-15 minutes sitting on the elliptical machine at lunch. And yeah, I figured I'd share what I learned with you today. The artwork is from Shutterstock and from a Alex... Weed. A weed? Oh no, can you put it in the pile? Yeah, well, I all the weeds go in the pile. Uh, truthfully, he's supposed to put the sticks in the pile, but... I see the other weed! He's supposed to put sticks in the pile uh, so that the lawn waste guy can pick it up. But, um, the... Good job! We don't go in the street when there are cars! <sighs> yeah, he is really eating up this podcast today. Well, that did not work at all, and now I'm in the car. So, speaking to the artwork used in the book, uh, there are some credits on the end pages for Shutterstock, uh, as well as a fellow uh, Alex. I'm going to have to reread. Uh, Editor Taylor, pipe up in there. Alex Damasino. Apologies, sir, if I mispronounce your name. I will link your Instagram in the show notes. Uh, I don't have the book on me, obviously, because I'm driving, but I can speak to what I remember from looking at the art. It's got a very zine-like je ne sais quoi. It illustrates what it's intended to illustrate. So, for example, when a paragraph is talking about uh, centipedes, there's a picture of a centipede. And the art, and as such, the art complements the content of the... Oh, I'm turning. And as such, the art complements the content. But it does not have a consistent theme. It's obviously... Some of it appears to be kind of photographic and gimped a little bit. Um, that is, gimp the software, not gimp as in, you know, the gag and mask and... Ugh. Yeah, so this review is going sideways pretty fast. Where was I? So the, the art is very obviously sourced uh, for illustrative purposes, but not exclusive purposes. And that gives it a very zine-like quality. And I know I said, I said that at the beginning, and I'm going to say it again, because it's characteristic. I'm not sure when it was published. Again, Editor Taylor, you can pipe up because it's written on the back. 2021. But 
it's got that same feel. It's got that tactile nature that uh, s somebody built it out of passion and not out of profit in mind. Side note, when uh, we did the World of Weird interview, uh, I, in the middle, I talked about a large skull and a little dude in red standing on top of the said skull, and then there was some shocked silence that I didn't quite understand, but y'all might have picked up on as the listeners. Well, looking at this zine, I noticed that it is, in fact, not a little dude standing on the skull. It is a sword with a handguard. A sword with a red handguard is the answer. So, that shock silence is because Stephen had absolutely no clue what I was talking about. The product identity's image, so to speak, uh, it is not OGL, so it's not literally product identity, uh, but it's the, the picture that's illustrative of the world of Weirth. Uh, that has a uh, definitive uh, identifying quality to it, but the rest of the art... Cutting back over to Editor Taylor, what I was trying to say there, the rest of the art appears to have been sourced and used to make the product look the way it was designed to look. So if he's talking about centipedes, there's an image of a centipede, as opposed to the logo, where the logo is identifying and thus has a little bit more investment involved. I am back at my desk and I've got the zine in my hand and we can do a little bit of a flip through. The first page is obviously the uh, title. It's got the synopsis and a picture of an isometric dungeon on it. Uh, flip open, the second page is upside down. Note that is not a problem with the PDF in and of itself. That's a problem with me. I fed the print paper in the wrong way when I'm doing double-sided, so your results may vary if you're better at the computer, but we will get back to that later. The first section of the book, uh, it's a, like I said, it's a step-by-step -step process, so we'll start with step one. A postulation that the dungeon and the wilderness are connected. Uh, so the advice that it gives is think about where the dungeon is. So if I'm in a swamp, put swamp related stuff in the dungeon. If I'm in orc country, think about what would live in orc country. Which is interesting, that's something that I do when I populate my own hex crawls, honestly. Uh, what I, I have a process where I will roll for locations and where they are, and then based on the encounter tables, I will roll to see what the theme is. So I can vouch that that does work. That's a good way to help identify what should live in the dungeon. And moreover, think about how are they going to interact with the outside world. So a lot of stuff that lives in the shallow dungeon in particular, it's not necessarily just going to stay there forever. It may come to the surface, it may forage, it may do business with lower levels good information to think about, uh, especially if you're trying to create a verisimilitudinous dungeon experience. Step two in the process is related to food and water. Uh, the author goes on to talk about in an environment above ground, you have a food chain. And in the same sense, he says you should put a food chain into your dungeon. So you're going to have water sources, you're going to have plants, you're going to have bugs, and they're going to range from the bottom of the food chain to the top. A provided example description uh, reads as follows. The room is bare, cold, and damp. The walls are discolored with mold, but still in good structural condition. Much of the floor is covered in a slimy, watery ooze which seeps from the walls, ceiling, and floor. One five-foot-wide passage leads out of the center of the long wall, south. Many small centipedes, six inches long, scurry about the floor. So what you hear there is a reference to a source of water, because, you know, it's kind of oozing out of the walls, as is natural in a lot of underground caverns, especially in my area. There's a reason Floridians don't have basements. Uh, but also, you have references to centipedes. So that's something that a mouse might eat. That's something that a snake might eat. And then you can build on the ecology from there. Which then takes us into step three. 
encounters are more than monsters. I love this section because it brings a great term to bear, dungeon livestock. That is, creatures that live in the dungeon that are effectively only there to provide the food chain. He gives a long list of examples uh, and then how they can prey on each other and a little bit of illustration going on to show you what some of the ones that he has in mind look like. And that's fun. That's great. And then that ties in to the next section, uh, section four, with uh, wandering monsters, putting those into your tables. So if you encounter a wandering monster, there should be a chance that these are going to be on the table. So uh, thinking back to our previous room description, room descriptions could include references to the lowest level of the food chain, the basest level of sustaining ecology and an ecosystem, and then the wandering monster tables could reinforce it by bringing out some of these suggestions as to how to maintain it. Is this something I have done? In the wilderness, yes. In the dungeon, no. So I have gotten at least one novel idea so far out of this zine. In the wilderness, I always incorporate a bunch of local fauna, and that kind of gives places uh, some character. That is not unique to me. There are lists in the AD&D DMG for various types of wildlife in various biomes. I believe it's in the Monster Manual also, so it goes back to 1978. So it's not a new concept for the wilderness, but it's interesting to apply that concept into the dungeon, treating the dungeon as an ecosystem in and of itself. Section 5, titled Layers and Treasure, is an expansion of a concept that I hinted at uh, very early on, dealing with different layers of the dungeon. So somebody who is close to the surface is likely going to come out of the surface, uh, whereas something deep in the ground is likely not going to want to come out of the ground. With that in mind, you're going to have to have some communication between the two of them, and you, know, you think about it, it's beneficial. So if I am friends with the Mind Flayers and apparently offer them some brains every once in a while, they may bring me stuff from the deeps where I, as a bandit lord, may not have the power to go. Uh, there are some suggestions for currencies based on dungeon level, based on scarcity and what might be interesting for the subterranean creatures. There is some talk about uh, barter economy, and there's a subsection of rules, uh, an optional rule for foraging in the darkness. So you're familiar with the concept of hunting uh, or foraging in the wilderness. In the same way you can treat the dungeon as a natural ecosystem, you can treat the dungeon as a forageable encounter. So he's got some rules, they're longer term, so you're likely going to use them if you're staying overnight in the dungeon or if you're deep deep in the, the under abyss. Times are measured in hours, but it's got some a pretty simple mechanic that will allow you to feed yourself outside of the rations you may have. Now, there's a chance that you may poison yourself getting some death cap mushrooms instead of the standard ones, but that's one of the hazards of adventuring as a lifestyle. To culminate the book, Stephen gives us some sample encounter tables. This is where my upside down page comes in. So the first table represents some surface encounters. Uh, the second table, some dungeon encounters that relate back to the surface encounters. And then some sub tables for creatures based on the dungeon ecology. So you have some of the livestock, you have some of the larger dungeon, uncommon dungeon, bigger, smaller, that kind of jazz. And I'm flipping back and forth between the two pages. We have a mechanism to generate the uh, encounters that we're talking about and to help to integrate that into your campaign. Lastly, uh, to comment, an interesting portion of this booklet, the last two tables are left unfinished. And there's a note at the bottom. I thought there, I thought I might have gotten a beta copy, but no, there is a note at the bottom. Fill in the above with monsters and animals appropriate to the terrain in your setting. Hmm. 
curious stuff. So you can copy and paste this and uh, redo table after table after table as biomes change. So it's a reusable resource in that regard. You have the more generified uh, top bit and then you have the more specific subtable that are referenced. So one thing that I would encourage if incorporating dungeon ecology like this I would be tempted to put more encounters in more as in more frequent uh, more encounters would allow you to have the dangerous ones or the opportunities for role play and collaboration with dungeon factions on top of building the verisimilitude of the environment uh, but that's a minor complaint and that's something that you as the dungeon master will be able to figure out uh, on your own. So there you have it. The Underground Dungeon Architect. You got some reusable content, some novel looks on timeless activities, and some information and procedures that you can incorporate into your home game. It's available on itch.io, World of Weirth, uh, for about four bucks. If you want to pick it up, uh, I don't have to. I got a freebie. Ha! Take that, non-podcasters. Start your own review channel. But, more seriously, you can check Stephen out at his itch page, his blog page, or on Substack. And while you're there, don't forget to check out his newer product, the Campaign Carnival. Active currently, it is a massive multiplayer online, offline, tabletop wargame product where folks across the country and across the world, I'm going to go with across the world, are playing the same campaign and moving forward according to a system of scenarios in classic, classic distributed fashion. So, always fun. Be on the lookout. I will provide some links in the show notes below. If that is not enough, come talk to the author himself over on the brand new Clerics Wear Ringmail official Discord. That's right, you guys were asking, and I'm going to deliver. I've set up a little server. I've got a handful of buddies, Stephen included, helping me kick the tires on it, and I think that's ready for prime time. So if you'd like to hang out with him, with me, or with most of the other folks who have appeared on the podcast, I will include that link too. Come on over and hang out with us online. From here, we got a couple call-ins, and so we'll uh, dive on into those. Speaking of monster stat conversions, was Prismatic Wasteland did a blog post recently on system neutral and system agnostic monsters, how to write them, how to notate them, and for OSR and NSR systems, uh, I think it's pretty easy to adjudicate that stuff on the fly, at least if you've run a few games already of your system of choice. Um, and I, I like the format that they're suggesting and probably going to use it for my own adventures. This is Direxon, by the way, in case you hadn't guessed. Um, I don't know why you would. I did, actually. Recognized your voice. Although, technically, Anchor does send me a notification to tell me who called in. <laughs> oh, side note, happy belated Father's Day, my bud. I know it's not your first, but I know little man should be just starting to chatter at you, and uh, he's not going to be old enough to say happy Father's Day yet, but don't worry, it's coming. Uh, but yeah, you just say stuff like, um, you know, stats as bear. Uh if you have a weird thing where, uh, you know, stats as wolf, has a bite, uh, wears leather, stuff like that. And with the system agnostic notation like that, you know that a bite in your system of choice is probably a D6 maybe in OSE and OD&D and stuff like that. Um, you know, you've seen similar monsters kind of statted that way. You might say like damage as dagger. And, you know, you might know that that means a D6 or a D4 in your system or some fancy footwork and some of the, the newer stuff. 12 on 2D6 to wound a target in plate, unless he is unhorsed and prone, in which case a 7 is sufficient. Um, but yeah, then you describe like some of the eccentricities of, uh, of your monster, like has a paralyzing touch. So, you know, in OSE or BX, you know, they're going to have a save versus paralysis. You don't have to write that. Um, or however else you're 
adjudicating that. Like, I guess if you're in 5e, you do like a constitution save or something. Um, and, you know, by the difficulty of the, by the difficulty of the monster, you know about how difficult um, that's going to be. Very interesting article. So, Prismatic Wasteland is on my blog roll, though admittedly I had missed this article. I don't read as much as I used to. Need to get back into it. Though, that said, I know I tend to use BX. Uh, I figure everybody knows BX. It's kind of a lingua franca. If you're in our hobby, then you've heard of BX at least, and most folks have played it. But uh, even with Chainmail, I'm into Chainmail and Original Edition these days, but it's very easy to swap between uh, those two editions, uh, even with the uh, foreignness of the original combat resolution. That said, I can def definitely see the advantages in terms of compatibility, talking about saying as leather instead of EC7. Uh, um, back to Chainmail, leather is as leather, so it's not as leather, it's literally, that's the name of the armor on the combat table. But I can definitely see the utility of doing that, especially when you're trying to bridge the gap into the NSR, which, as I'm led to believe, has some tonal fidelity but isn't necessarily mechanically bound to the OSR roots. In any case, uh, for anyone who's interested, I do believe I've got the link for that, and I will put it into the show notes. Thank you, Direct Sun, for the call in, and very interesting observations. Thank you for making them. Hey, Del Vaughn, and I look forward to hearing from you again. Well, Taylor, I don't necessarily agree with everything you said in your immersion chat, um, but I know you're aiming at certain people and certain things, and that's fine. You can do that without naming who you're aiming at, because it's only passive aggressive. But I will say that, you know, the idea of talking to other NPCs, or I'm sorry, PCs talking to other PCs around the campfire in character is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, that was one of the good player tips that our good buddy Spike Pit put out years ago on his show. I'm not sure that that episode's available at this time. But, you know, he was talking about things you can do as a PC to help the game. And one of those was for your PC to ask other PCs questions to help it, help them get into the game and how you could be a better player. So I'm sorry that you don't appreciate that. Anyhow, let me listen to the rest of your show. Regarding taking aim at people, you are correct. I did not name any people. The reason for it is because I wasn't intending to attack those people, but instead the culture that they're bringing into the game and the method by which they engage with the game. I'm waging war on an idea, on a concept, and the purpose of the conversation was to establish my position uh, on that cosmic struggle. To speak to Colin, he seems like a stand-up guy. Uh, I've got a lemon tree for him if he ever comes to visit. Um, and to speak to that episode, I don't know if it's up either. Uh, I don't remember having heard it, uh, but at the same time, I do know that Colin has taken his podcast, a lot of the old episodes, off the air. He's uh, gussying them up, dolling them up, and shining them like new. In a very George Lucas fashion, he's taking the same old ideas, same old Colin, and putting it into a shiny, new, slick presentation. So, Colin, if that particular episode is in the back catalog, feel free to link it to us. I'll be happy to listen. Does role-playing with other players, bouncing off of each other at a campfire as though you were your characters in the middle of the night, help you to get into character, to explore your character, and to understand the dynamic uh, of the relationships between the members of the party? Yes, it does. But... It comes down to expectations. I'm playing a fantasy adventure game. To read an excerpt from The Seven Voyages of uh, Zelarthan, the use of the term fantasy adventure game over the more often used role-playing game is intentional. Strikingly, the term role-playing appears nowhere in the original 1974 texts. Ideally, we who like this sort of game are interested in adventure, cooperating exploring a fantastical world of strange terrors and fabulous treasures, not perfectly simulating the attitude and behavior of some grumpy dwarf or whatever. Indeed, too much role-playing should be discouraged. We don't explore characters, we explore dungeons, as someone once said. So, at the end of the day, it's 
a matter of expectations. And ideally, at the beginning of a session, that baseline will be established. When somebody shows up to your Vampire the Masquerade session dressed as Blade, you'll know that you messed that second part up. That last message was more snarky than it was meant to be. Sorry about that. Um, but I do think there are a place for all these things. The garbage. Booyah! And I think you're probably responding to certain people's comments, but since you're not calling them out and not hearing the other side, all I hear are your snarky responses. So it kind of makes it hard to judge the true validity of your arguments. But, you know, I'm just an internet guy, and my opinion's, well, what you paid for. So now I'm going to go listen to the calls. But I do apologize for the super snarkiness, because you don't deserve that. And I should have inflicted it upon you. For the outside listener, when I got this message originally, I re-listened to my episode, and reached out to Jason in private to make sure I didn't owe anybody an apology. The reason I did that uh, is because the topic of Im some elements of immersion had come up on a call-in episode of his show. Like I said in the first segment, I was not attacking those people, merely establishing that I feel differently and enjoy a different style of game. Jason was able, on our conversation online, to articulate himself very eloquently in criticism of my position. I will not read the whole conversation. He has not given me permission. However, in that this message was originally not going to make it onto the episode, but then he taunted me a little bit on Audio Dungeon, so here we go. Uh, this is the message I was going to read back. The problem is that with the generalization of your aggressive arguments, it is hard to give a counterpoint, so it came across as a show that just wanted people to call in and agree, as the specifics weren't there to draft a proper response. That is a fair argument. However, as a counter, I submit that it is not the generalization of arguments that makes it difficult to counter my position, but instead the fact that I'm right. That said, I am always a person to please, so, in the interest of pleasing our good buddy Jason, he, uh, we need to call somebody out. I submit, Cerebravor, episode B6, season one, six minutes in. As far as the length, yeah, definitely for online, and I could see for weeknights in person, too, two to three hours. And two to three hours doesn't sound very long, but online, if you're doing, say, theater in the mind i think you can get a whole lot done in that time frame uh, i've got a good buddy of mine who actually was one of the first people i ever played online with this is way before covid this is like 2016 2017 and, and he runs a lot of barbarians of lemuria and he tends to run two hour sessions and it's all theater of the mind he might draw a sketch and put it up we'll do it with a you know video and voice chat only rolling dice at home paper character sheets all that and we get a lot done in those sessions we really do because you're not fiddling with the vtt's who then now, Jason? Who then now? Listeners, you heard it here first. Physical dice are the way to go. VTTs are slow and mess up play. And theater of the mind is the only way to get anything done in a role-playing game. Cerebravore, episode bonus six, season one. Greetings. Hey, bud. Thanks for tuning in to... It's uh, Hobbs here. Sorry about that. A little Sean P. Kelly voice in the background. Hey, uh, I have listened to the last couple episodes. First, the uh, World of Weirth, and then um, Immersion. And I had some really quippy things to say, but your episode was so long, I forgot what they were. Until Carl called in at the end about World of Worth. And I wanted to say the alignment thing was something that I really liked as well. And I've been looking for something very similar to that for my western game for a long time which is all about moral choices and how far are you willing to go on the frontier in order to succeed i wanted to mention that helvetia also uses a vice and virtue with a, a a metric that affects you know things that you're trying to do depending on where you lie on that the only problem i feel like it's still arbitrary and up to the gm to decide which is which Thank you for calling in, my man. You and Sean are welcome to call in at any time. 
Regarding uh, Helvetia, I have not actually seen it. I think I've played in uh, one of Gabor's products before, but I never read it or ran it as the referee. Uh, we'll have to reach out to Steven and see if he's seen it, do a little bit of internal comparison. Talking about morality, uh, seeing how far somebody's going to go, you're pretty much right. There's no way to escape that it's going to be up to the referee. It's going to be up to the GM uh, as to what constitutes good, bad, or law and chaos. It, it's kind of like alignment in Kalmata. It's a little different than alignment in the Ash Coast. The game I'm starting up that maybe a certain caller on this podcast may uh, make an appearance in. But I digress. The important part is remembering that that's what makes it interesting. If we all agreed on the right and wrong, then it wouldn't be stimulating to experience it from each other's perspectives. Now, that said, from a gamist perspective, I think the key is to be consistent. The big thing with uh, Steven's alignment axis that attracted me to it was mechanization and consistency. You had a score and it moved and you knew things that you could do to move your score. You knew things that you could do to wiggle within it. And so you knew, you know, you hear the ephemeral paladin problem is if you find the orc babies, it's a catch-all because if you let them live, that's a chaotic act. And if you kill them, that's an evil act. Well, in a mechanized version, then whether you kill them or not, or whether you let them go or not, it's up to the referee as to whether or not that's good, bad, or indifferent. But if you're on a sliding scale, the paladin doesn't necessarily have to be just this abstract lawful good. You could be, say, I need to be between a two and a three on the law scale. So if killing the baby orcs takes me from three all the way down to two, I'm still a paladin. Uh, Alternatively, if letting them go on the, uh, takes me from three down to two and a half, Mm, I'm still good to go, and I've made the decision that fits with my character and doesn't hurt me mechanically. So I do think I will have to check out a Helvetia because that is very interesting to me, but also the important part is consistency so that the players know what they're interacting with and they can make informed decisions. Them, at least them's my two coppers. That sounds like a wrap to me. So from here, I want to say thank you uh, first to Stephen for the review copy. It was fun paging through it and walking through your thought process while designing a dungeon. Uh, I want to thank my callers. Thank you, Direct Sun. I have your entry sitting in my little entry box for the summer competition. Excited for that drawing. Uh, Thank you, Nerds Variety Jason, for calling in and giving me something new to talk about. And thank you, Hobbs, for the pointer on the new to me product. So I did mention two things there. One, the summer contest. Don't forget, uh, give me a call or carrier pigeon. Uh, That's the consistent joke. That's the one that keeps running through. Reach out to me on one of the ways on the blog uh, that I've detailed and tell me about a monster from one system that you can convert into another and tell me how you're going to do it. You have until June 31st. I love how no one's called me on the fact that June has 30 days yet, but you have until the end of the month to send it to me, and I will make that happen. The winner uh, will be drawn randomly from a hat. That's not a qualitative or quantitative judgment. It's randomized, and that winner will get $15.15 store credit at DriveThruRPG on a gift card, and a charity of their choice will get a matched $15 donation. Uh, Or if you don't have one, I'll find one, so no pressure there. Other thing, uh, I gave uh, Jason Nerds Variety Variety a hard time in the middle of the episode. That's all in fun. Be on the lookout, because at the end of our private conversation that I mentioned in the episode, we agreed that it would probably be better to have a real conversation on it, because the subject of immersion is more nuanced than can probably be given credit for on a ranty drive home. So uh, we're going to find some time to... Uh, figure that out. I've got a couple things going on in my life right now, but in the near future, we're going to have an episode with Jason on and we're going to talk about immersion. Me from the old school perspective and him from that uh, faux brew story game and stuff, whatever he's running, Barbarians of Book Moria. (laughs) 
anyway, for everybody who has made it thus far, thank you for listening. Uh, for everybody who has called in and entered into the contest, thank you for entering. And for folks who haven't unscri- unsubscribed at this point, thank you for sticking with me. And for everybody all together, delve on. The Clear Square Ring Mail podcast is an independently owned and operated product released for educational and informative purposes under the Totally Steal This license, which is kind of like Creative Commons, except f- licensing. Segments recorded within a vehicle are recorded using a Bluetooth hands-free device in conjunction with local vehicular safety legislation. The music for the Clear Square Ring Mail podcast is Gold Coffee by Michael Ramirez, retrieved from Mixkit.co and used under the Mixkit royalty-free music license. Sound effects used in the Clear Square Ring Mail podcast are also retrieved from Mixkit.co and used in accordance with the Mixkit-free sound effects license. Clear Square Ring Mail does not describe to nor endorse views or opinions expressed by call-ins, guests, or even the host, unless you think they're awesome, and thus does not assume any liability regarding the consumption or distribution of this podcast. By listening to the Clear Square Ring Mail podcast, you agree to these provided terms. Parties with questions regarding these terms, conditions, or releases are encouraged to reach out to Clear Square email at the prescribed methods provided on the clearest wearing email blog. Parties dissatisfied with these terms, conditions, or releases are encouraged to go suck an egg. I've got my... I never want to listen to them unless you do, you do have to roll or you have, um, we're lifted, you have read, we're lifted to them